concentration is a very very important part or an aspect of any of the contract now we all know in india and across the globe there are several intellectual thoughts ideas which are being created by individuals each one of them are important they have their own value a contract which is subjected to certain contingency certain conditions all together wagering agreement is a variable factor what are the wagering agreement what are the terms and conditions good morning and welcome to the model question paper solving in commercial law fourth semester bba which is going to be a very interesting session where we're going to discuss about the questions that are likely to come in your examination starting with the 15 markers that we are going to see the first question is define contract explain the essentials of valid contract now we all know that in a commercial law this particular question is a mandatory question why because this is most of the time this is repeated and this is a fundamental question that can be asked in any walk of life so that's why we will start with this question define a contract we know that contract is a formal agreement between two parties who have verbally as well as agreed in writing on specific terms and condition followed by the essentials of contract which you know that there are seven essentials of contract starting with about the consent then it starts in terms of agreement it starts in terms of the contract should not have anything illegal in nature the contract should not be void ab initio the contract should not involve minor so all those essential factors you will be discussing it in the contract factor now when you are writing an answer for a 15 marks in a law paper it is very very essential that you stick to the point rather than just writing the theory in a law paper we expect you to write exactly as what it has been prescribed the next one who is a minor which we are going to talk about now when we talk about who is a minor a minor is a person who has not attain the age of 18 and that is very very important for all of us to understand as per the government of India we define anybody who has not attained the age of 18 as minor so is it agreeable for us to go with an agreement to a minor definitely not so once you have defined who is a minor explain the legal effects automatically the first thing is done that you are not eligible to go in for a direct agreement with a minor on the behalf of minor a guardian has to sign has to get into a contract so anything that has to be done a guardian or a parent has to done the minor cannot directly get into the contract so you will be explaining the legal effects the first thing itself suppose you form an agreement with a minor the entire agreement will be considered to be void it is illegal in nature so that's why we don't consider minors agreement to be a true agreement so there would be a guardian there would be a caretaker who will sign on behalf of the minor and any kind of transaction actions shall be continued with the guardian with that person's concern and not with the minor directly the next one define consideration what is a consideration all about when we talk about the word consideration that means something in return see whenever we are signing a contract whenever we are doing a business transaction there should be something in return i'm going to sell my goods to you for the sake of money i'm going to do this work in return i have to get this so there is some consideration that has to be established between the two parties so that's why consideration is said to be something in return now the general rules of a valid consideration is first of all the business that we are going to get into it should be legal the terms should be fixed and they should not be variable there should be a proper contract with all the agreements in place the nature of business should be well within the rules and laws of the country then we start getting into the consideration factor now whenever we talk about consideration the one thing that you have to keep in your mind is that 
Consideration is a very very important part or an aspect of any of the contract. So whenever you are drafting an agreement, you should tell specifically what is that you are going to get in return. Suppose you are going to get in return money or some favor or some kind of help that has to be mentioned in the contract agreement. You cannot just take an agreement plainly without a consideration or without any kind of agreements followed by what is free consent now free consent is something where you will have to talk about a business or an factor where you are going to talk about the consent of the parties whether a party is free enough that means without any pressure coming on to that party on to that person that's where we are talking about free consent which means the persons who are going to engage in an agreement in a contract are free to go ahead and form a contract or agreement they are not subjected to any kind of pressure they are not subjected to any kind of external threat or any kind of coercion so that's why we say that it's a free consent which means to say suppose if there is going to be a pressure if I'm going to threaten you to get into one contract into an agreement or into any kind of scenarios then that will not be considered as a free consent that would be put under some threat or some pressure zone now why is free consent so important for any agreement because when you are going to go and form a contract, a person should have an acceptance both from the heart and from the mind level. He should be free from all kinds of external thoughts and process wholeheartedly he should understand and agree to the terms and conditions of the business and then they need to sign upon the contract. Now for example if somebody signs a contract under pressure and then he wants to prove the same thing in the court of law it might not be proved why because the court will come back and say that sir at that point of time you have signed and shown your consent you should have raised your factors your legal considerations at that time itself now if you come back and raise a voice over the consent it will not be considered so free consent is one when both the parties involved in the agreement or contract have agreed upon the terms and conditions clearly and they are not subjected to any kind of external threat now the next one when we are going to talk about the offer and acceptance is again continues from the valid contract standpoint itself when we are talking about an offer and acceptance that means I'm giving you an offer now you are accepting the offer this is where offer and acceptance the first level offer means that you have been given an opportunity or been given with a proposal now that proposal whether if you are okay to it you understand it it is taken up by you then it becomes an acceptance suppose you are okay with that offer the terms and conditions are very much suiting you then we are going to call it as acceptance suppose the condition are not acceptable in nature then the offer gets rejected that's where it becomes very very important so what happens here is that the offer has to be valid the offer has to be legal the offer must contain all the valid documents valid statements it should be quantifiable in nature it should be of any kind of away from all kinds of threat it should not be a void ab initio kind of a thing so the offer that has been given itself whether it is a valid offer or not we need to first check it suppose it is a kind of offer which is against the law against the society against the country then that offer itself will become invalid and we will not be talking about the acceptance level but once the offer is considered that is with all its documentation steps and procedure the next step becomes acceptance so once you accept an offer you are willing showing your acceptance in terms of taking up the offer 
that's what we call as offer and acceptance the next one what is discharge of contract now the discharge of contract is how you are executing the contract that's what we say by discharge of contract so once the contract is formed the executionary part of the contract how the contract is fulfilled how you take up the initiative in terms of completing the contract what are all the steps that have been told for followed mentioned suppose it has to be delivered in a particular way it has to be completed in a particular manner that's what we are going to talk about in terms of discharge of contract so the ways and means of discharge of contract are many wherein you would start understanding the nature of contract the conditions that are involved in the contract how the contract has to be executed what are all the terms and conditions involved all those factors you will be explaining it here followed by remedies for a breach of contract very very important for all of us why because suppose let's say that you are not able to maintain a contract you didn't follow the rules and regulations that has been told so that will lead to a breach moment let me first explain what is a breach here breach means going against the rules and regulations of the contract that's what we call it as breach of contract now breach the word itself is very very interesting it's very very important for all of us to understand why the word breach now breach is something which has happened because either you didn't follow the rules and regulations because you felt the conditions are not appropriate because you took things lightly in terms of not understanding the terms and the values so there is a breach of contract that happens now the remedy for a breach of contract is that the other party the aggrieved party can go to the court of law and can claim a compensation for the breach of contract now when you go to the court of law to claim over the breach of contract the documentation the statements the validation under which terms and conditions the contract was signed all those factors will be questioned so what we are now trying to do in terms of the remedies means because of the violation of contract one of the party has to suffer the loss so in order to compensate that loss in order to take care of all the business activity flow that has got interrupted there will be a remedy that has to be provided to the aggrieved party so that's where we are bringing in this concept called as remedies to the breach of contract followed by let's talk about the define of competition act of 2002 now the competition commission of india started way back in the year 2004 itself actually 2002 the act was formed from 2004 the commission was created it's called as the cci that means the competition commission of india which looks into the ethics and the factors in which the business need to come compete suppose companies and industries tend to get into monopoly tend to get into a cartel formation altogether which in turn will affect the competition which will in turn affect the flow of business in a country then the competitive commission of india the competition commission can come forward and put a break there now what the main ambition the main thing is that they want the competition to be healthy and it should not be you know prejudiced or it should not be going in one particular direction only it should be available for all equal opportunity should be provided so the competition commission of india comes back with certain rules and regulations they tell very clearly if you are found practicing certain acts which are against the ethics which are against the law which are against the system altogether there might be a penalty that will be charged against you similarly you will also be subjected to certain other conditions which can stop you from doing the business in india 
Now, in this case, you can start giving examples of Amazon, you can start giving examples of Google, you can start giving the examples of Pepsi, Paytm. So many people have been called in terms of following the rules against the, the Competition Act practice altogether. There are many companies in India which have been subjected to law and their treatments by the CCI because they felt that they are trying to choke the market, they are trying to hold the market from other players into coming into picture either by pricing or by advertising or by holding a monopoly or by forming a cartel. All these kind of things are said to be against the natural rules of competition. So in that scenario, the CCI examples with all these companies can be given and your answer can be elaborate in nature followed by the 10 markers. I would like to start with the IPR, define the IPR Act, the intellectual properties, right? Now, we all know in India and across the globe, there are several intellectual thoughts, ideas, which are being created by individuals. Each one of them are important. They have their own value. But what happens in a normal scenario is that people tend to copy somebody's idea and make use of it. So in order to stop all these kind of activity, we have started with the intellectual property right, which tries to protect the rights of a person who has invented it, who holds the right over the innovation altogether. It is his intellectual property and asset that has been created by that individual. So now now what happens here is that when we talk about this IPR, we try to first identify what kind of rights you have over that innovation. So the IPR, the Patents Office with the intellectual property rights and other factors comes into picture in terms of protecting the person and in terms of avoiding the illegal use or the misuse of that particular property, particular idea, service or the product. So they try to cover in terms of the trademarks, rights, patents and everything and they give this intellectual property right into that person who tries to own that particular aspect followed by what is a quasi contract a quasi contract is actually one which is not a real contract it is just a part of the contract which means you are not directly subjected into contract you are not directly liable for that contract but you are a part of the contract because it has been taken into that position. So quasi contracts will not have a direct implication as per the law. But yes, you will be subjected to certain terms and conditions if you are a part of the contract. Now, next one, coercion and undue influence, a very, very important and an interesting question, which has been asked many times. Coercion and you. The word coercion itself means you are giving some push, you are giving some pressure on somebody. You are trying to get somebody, get certain things done by applying pressure to his mind, to his body, to his entire environment altogether. Why is this coercion first of all considered to be illegal? For any person to be a part of the contract, the law says very clearly that the person should be free from any kind of external matters of subject. But what happens in a normal course of business is that since people want things to happen in their favor, they try to put the parties under pressure. Now that pressure can be physical, mental, moral or financial pressures. Now what happens in this scenario is that because that party comes under pressure, because that party is subjected to some kind of threat, he has to sign the paper. Now this kind of activity is considered to be purely illegal because the law forbids it, provides it saying that it is completely illegal in nature. The similar thing when we talk about an undue influence is that I might come under the influence of alcohol or if you are under the influence of some other drugs or you are under the influence of somebody else, words or action, then automatically if you tend to continue to sign under that particular thing, the entire contract is considered to be void. So coercion and undue influence are a 
kind of negative factors that can go ahead and create a roadblock to the contract itself. So that's why we tend to say here very clearly that when we are talking about coercion and undue influence, coercion is a kind of a direct pressure, undue influence is more of indirect in nature. So one has to understand these two factors very clearly and these two factors will matter a lot when it comes to in terms of understanding the scenario of signing the contract. Now the next one is the five markers. We're going to talk about contingent contract. What do you mean by contingent contract? A contract which is subjected to certain contingency, certain conditions altogether. So based on the condition only the contract will work. So this will consist of lot of ifs and buts that have to be understood inside the contract. Only if this happens then the contract is validated. If that particular situation or that particular stand does not occur, then we are not getting into contingency at all. So please try to understand this factor. Contingent contract means to say that it is all about holding yourself to certain rules, to certain conditions, to certain formats altogether. So that's why we call this as a contingent contract at any given point of time. Now, what happens here is that in a contingent contract, now if that terms are not viable, if the terms are not being held, then the contract itself does not become valid by any given means or by any given chance altogether followed by a vagaring agreement. A vagaring agreement is a variable factor. What are the vagaring agreement? What are the terms and conditions? The variations that are involved in the agreement factor based on that you will be writing a vagaring note. So you will be telling what are all the terms conditions under which the agreement is formed and the intellectual property that we have already discussed where we try to talk about the rights over a particular product, a service or innovation that is done by a person, what are all the rights that he has to protect that particular activity, that particular product or a service without being getting misused, copied or directly presented somewhere else. Why? Because intellectual property is like an asset to the nation. It's an asset in terms of the development of the country, development of that person and it is the intellectual hard work that goes inside. So the intellectual property right is a very very important part in law which tries to protect the person in terms of his particular idea or knowledge or application being completely misused. So with this I come to the end of the model question paper discussion. I hope and believe that all the information that has been shared through this particular session will be of a great help and resource to you. I wish all of you a very best in the upcoming examination. Please do well and score well. Thank you once again for joining me today on this wonderful session.